taking a lot longer than I expected. My bad. All right, there we go. All right, we are now live. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out. Uh, just a couple announcements before today's shadowing session. Uh, if you haven't, make sure to join our email list on our website. Uh, we're going to link that in the chat. Um, it's, it's a listserv. You can stay up to date on all of our uh, future sessions. Um, also, if you haven't already followed Shellcast on LinkedIn, uh, make sure to follow our page in there and list us as one of your experiences. And um, we heard a lot of your um, we heard a lot of your um, uh, concerns, and uh, we have extended the timeline of the quizzes and journals to 48 hours uh, because we know how uh, stressful online classes are and everything. Um, we're also working on uh, other platforms to provide the, the shadowing sessions for you guys, so I'll be on the lookout for that announcement. Um, make sure you subscribe and like, and without further ado, we'd like to introduce our uh, physician today, Dr. Malavi. She's a pathologist at Sinai Hospital, uh, the chief uh, pathologist at Sinai Hospital. She completed her residency and received her PhD in neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University and, really, and re <clears throat> received her MD from Washington University in St. Louis. Her work includes analyzing uh, biopositive tissue, body fluids, and interpreting other diagnostic tests. Um, Pathology is super interesting, and we're super excited for uh, what Dr. Malavi has to share with us today. So without further ado, um, take it away. Great. Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Um, so I am sitting in my office, and I've got the blazing sun right on my face, and I'm going in and out of shadows. So you may not be able to see my face too well, but um, mostly I'm going to be uh, talking with the PowerPoint screen here and showing images. Um, this is, I, I do a lot of teaching and I'm a really informal teacher. So um, I am always happy to be interrupted with questions. It's kind of hard um, in a digital environment to raise your hand, but you know, those of you who I can see on the screen, just feel free to wave me down or interrupt if, you, if there's a question that comes over on the channel. Um, I'm happy to, to answer stuff. Um, I don't know necessarily what you guys want to know. So, you know, if I gloss over something or say something that um, doesn't make sense, just slide me down. All right, so we're going to talk about pathology. Um, and pathology is kind of its own special branch of medicine. Like we have very little overlap with the other specialties. Um, and it, in part, it's, it's um, sort of exacerbated by the fact that the pathology you see on TV or on movies is really just autopsies. Right? It's really just forensic pathology. So we have um, Quincy M.E., which was probably the first uh, Hollywood pathologist back from the 70s and 80s. Here he is on the morgue table where we do our autopsies. Um, and then, of course, there's a ton of crime dramas now like CSI um, and all the CSI breakaways and, you know, all these uh, crime dramas that always have a pathologist involved in them, usually doing sort of improbable things um, in the autopsy, things that we don't actually have tests for. Um, there's another one, Harrow, which is an Australian crime, dra crime drama, again, with a forensic uh, pathologist. And Rosewood TV series um, recently with a pathologist in Miami. And of course, there are pathologists in the movies, right? So this is Men in Black, but the pathologist was so cool that they hired her. <laughs> um, and then we have Concussion. This is actually a really good movie, and if you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. It's um, uh, also starring Will Smith, um, who plays Dr. Bennett Omalu, um, who is an actual real life pathologist um, who several years ago uh, published his findings on chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is the cumulative head injury seen in most famously NFL players, but, but really anyone who takes a lot of um, concussive hits. And he, uh, so the movie is, is sort of about his fight to kind of make this public and, um, go up against the NFL. Um, so it's a, it's a good movie. And then of course, there's the ubiquitous, ubiquitous alien autopsy. Um, this happens to be Independence Day where they find an alien, cut it up. And of course, like all good pathology movies, it starts Will Smith. 
right? So what is pathology? This is a um, unique medical specialty dedicated to the examination of human tissues. There is a specialty of veterinary pathology, but you get there through vet school, not through medical school. Um, human tissues, fluids, and bodies for the purposes of medical diagnosis and or forensic examination. So pathology has two tracks, um, which are often combined into one training pathway. They're called AP and CP. And AP stands for anatomic pathology, and that's the study of all the tissues. So everything from pap smears to autopsies and everything in between biopsies, tumors, all of that, that's all anatomic pathology. CP stands for clinical pathology, and that is really more the blood testing side of pathology. So that would include blood banking, any blood bank, um, you know, blood donor center or blood transfusion center is always managed by a pathologist. Um, microbiology falls under clinical pathology, um, clinical chemistry, uh, clinical drug testing, all of that. So pathology is a single residency program. It's open to MDs and DOs, and it's either three or four years. So if you're doing the combined track, which is called APCP, it's a four-year residency. If you're just doing AP or just doing CP, it's only three years, but those tend to limit you to, to certain jobs. So most people do the four-year track just for the maximum flexibility. And then there are several fellowships, accredited fellowships, um, including forensic pathology. So if you wanna become a medical examiner, that's the pathway. You do three or four years of residency. A lot of them just do the three-year AP track and then a year of forensic pathology, which you do at a medical examiner. Um, so the one in Baltimore, for example, has multiple fellows per year. You can do dermatopathology, molecular pathology, which is mostly the genetics of tumors, um, hematopathology, which is lymphoma, leukemia, and others. Um, or you can just stop there and be a general pathologist. Um, I, I actually did a fellowship in breast pathology, but then I came to a hospital where they didn't have a big breast service. So I don't really do that much breast pathology, even though I'm subspecialty trained. Um, I just, I do everything here. But Will Smith is not involved in any way, sadly. Um, what kind of jobs do pathologists have? So my job is general community practice in a uh, community hospital. So I'm up at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore. We're a multi-hospital system and um, I, you know, my office is in the hospital. I'm not an employee of the hospital. We're actually a private group, but, but all my time is spent here at the hospital. Um, and some other people in my group kind of rotate among multiple hospitals, but we're all generalists. We do everything. Um, we do both the laboratory clinical side and the tissue anatomic pathology side. Uh, we don't do really any research and teaching at, this, at our hospitals. So you can also do academic pathology, which is usually almost always subspecialty. Um, when people uh, stay in academics, they do tend to get down to kind of their own niche and just specialize in one organ system or one group of organs. Um, and that's gonna be practicing at an, an academic hospital where there's a um, pathology residency program. Some pathologists work at private outpatient laboratories, often signing out one specific type of biopsy, like you might have a derm path laboratory that's just signing out skin biopsies and that's all they do. Um, prostate, like at um, urology centers, often are affiliated with a GU, a genital urinary pathologist who just signs out their prostate biopsies. Um, you can be a medical examiner, which we've talked about. Um, and there are also jobs available on the clinical pathology side where you are the medical director of a clinical laboratory, a um, clinical testing laboratory. Any lab that's doing blood testing has to have a pathologist overseeing it. Um, so that's, some people do that full time, some people just make that part of their, their other jobs. But pathology is mysterious to everyone, other doctors included. Um, and that's for a lot of reasons. One is that your medical school classroom education, so the first two years um, before you get on the wards, it, it, your education in pathology there is very abstract. Um, it's sort of oriented towards this visual, you know, pattern matching, like this is what melanoma looks like. Memorize this image, and then you get a multiple choice on an exam, and what's this? It's melanoma. 
um, and sort of textbook type cases. Um, and that is actually very far removed from what we do in our job of pathology. So it's not a great introduction to pathology as a job or a field, um, your first two years of medical school. And then most medical schools do not have a required rotation in pathology during the clinical years. Um, so as I'm sure a lot of you know by now, you, there are certain required rotations, like everyone does medicine, surgery, pediatrics, OB, psych, um, but pathology is usually not a required rotation. So some people never get exposed to it at all in their entire training. Um, once you get into residency, residents in other fields generally do not rotate through pathology with a couple, a couple exceptions. Um, dermatology does tend to rotate through because they're so um, closely involved with, with the dermatic pathologists, but most others do not. We tend not to be that visible in the hospital. Um, that's partly cultural and partly logistic. We're sort of off in the lab and, and we're just not mingling with the, the uh, other clinicians as much. So a lot of times, you know, they only know you from a name on the paper or from a phone call, from a voice over the phone. And finally, pathologists on TV only do autopsies, either alien or forensic, neither of which are really big parts of most of our jobs. So again, no one really knows too much about um, our daily lives. So most fields in medicine have this meme. This is the pathology one. So what my parents think I do, you know, I'm a doctor, but I will tell you, I lost my stethoscope like 20 years ago. I don't even know where it is. Um, what my friends think I do, forensic autopsies. What my patients think I do, yeah, nobody knows. Patients don't even know we exist. If they do know we exist, they assume that we're in the basement doing things in a lab, you know, like Frankenstein. What my spouse thinks I do, my husband is in primary care. And so his days are very hectic with seeing patients and charting and all of that. And compared to him, I seem to have an awful lot of time to like check emails and, you know, do stuff on the computer. So I think he thinks that that's really all I do all day. What other doctors think I do. Um, so there is this misconception among other physicians that pathology is kind of like a scratch off lottery ticket. Like you just put it under the microscope and all is revealed. It's, you just uncover the answer and there it is. Um, but it's really not nearly that simplistic. So we're not, we're not just turning letters around um, on the Wheel of Fortune board. And finally, what I actually do. This is a pathologist sitting in a microscope. You can probably see, let's see, the uh, exact, very similar microscope right here. That's where I do all my work. Um, and uh, she's sitting there with stacks and stacks of glass slides. So that's, that's a good chunk of my day right there. So, but despite our black box reputation, we are actually really important in the hospital. We drive clinical care, especially in cancer treatment. Um, so without, a, you, you require pathology for the diagnosis of cancer. So when someone has, if they suspect cancer, you have to get a biopsy, you have to find out what kind of cancer it is, that's pathology. But we also diagnose inflammatory diseases and infectious diseases and you know other, other disease processes. We do staging of tumors in cancer. Um, so that's determining how far the cancer has grown in addition to how aggressive it is, what type it is, what type of um, chemotherapies it might respond to, that kind of thing. Um, interpretation of prognostic markers in cancer care. So you've probably heard of hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Well, the people that determine whether the breast cancer is going to respond to estrogen or progesterone are the pathologists. And we do that on the tissue slide. And finally, the assessment of treatment response in multiple diseases. So you, you know, will get a biopsy of someone, make a diagnosis, then they'll treat the patient and they'll come back for another biopsy to see if the treatment is working. We work closely with oncologists who are cancer uh, specialists, surgeons, gastroenterologists, pulmonologists, and other subspecialists. And we're a critical pillar of the multidisciplinary approach to cancer, which is oncology, surgery, radiology, and pathology. Those are the four essential components in a, in a cancer center, aside from, you know, all the other like pharmacy and nursing and social work and all that. A couple pictures. So this is melanoma. Um, so what we're looking at here is a pink and purple stain called the H&E stain. Um, and this is the standard stain. This is what all of our stuff is stained with, at least on the first pass. We can 
we can get other stains, but this is, this is what we start with. So the hematoxylin and eosin, or H&E stain, there's two stains. And it's a blue stain that stains nucleic acids. So all the nuclei are blue dots, circles. And then it's an eosin is a counter stain that stains the proteins pink. So most of the cytoplasm in the, in the cells uh, is gonna stain pink. And then there are some things that don't stain at all, like carbohydrates tend not to pick up any stain. So they'll look clear uh, on the slide. And this is actually the surface of the skin. Um, on, this is a very high power magnification, um, probably about 200x. Um, and these like pale cells that you see kind of making their way upward through the, the um, normal skin epithelium right here are melanoma cells. They're not particularly um, darkly pigmented in this case. Um, some melanomas do have a lot of brown pigment and others do not. Um, but this is a typical melanoma and, and not a subtle one. <clears throat> this is from a colon biopsy. It was sent to us as a polyp in the colon. It's actually a seed. So sometimes a seed will get stuck to the colon wall and it looks like a bump and the endoscopist takes it off and sends it to us. And we're like, yeah, that's, that's vegetable matter. This is a regular stain, but it's under polarized light just for fun because it makes it pretty. This is um, an aspirate from the thyroid. So in the thyroid, when, when you're getting a biopsy of thyroid, they usually do the biopsy by sticking a needle in and sucking up cells. Instead of cutting out a piece, they sort of aspirate um, some cells um, through a needle. And then we smear them out on the slide and make the diagnosis that way, which is good because it's a really non-invasive way to get a biopsy. It doesn't require any sutures or anything like that. Um, but this happens to be a smear of papillary thyroid cancer, which is a pretty common type of thyroid cancer. And finally, this is peripheral blood. These are red blood cells. This is a neutrophil, uh, white blood cell. They don't usually have four leaf clover lobes like that, but that one was photogenic um, and platelets. So looking at blood smears is also part of our job. We do electrophoresis. So you've heard of the technique of electrophoresis, either of um, DNA or proteins. This is actually a protein electrophoresis that we use to diagnose a disease called multiple myeloma, which is a disease of the blood. And then we get tubes, right? So our clinical pathology is basically just fluids and tubes, whether it's blood, urine, CSF, um, occasionally you know, amniotic fluid, that kind of thing. And we do tests on those. So in my typical week, um, a lot of glass slides to look at. That's really the largest part of my job is just take, getting microscopic slides um, <clears throat> and looking at them under the microscope. And a slide is just, you know, you probably can't see that on the camera because um, it's clear, but it's about that big. Um, and it's got a little piece of tissue on it and the tissue is stained with the H&E stain, pink and purple. And I put it on the microscope and, you know, interpret it. Um, the slides might come from biopsies, like breast biopsies, cervix biopsies, prostate biopsies, skin, um, or other lumps and bumps um, that they're worried about. We, can, we get whole organs, you know, we'll get a lung, we'll get a kidney, a stomach, usually for cancer, but occasionally for other reasons. We get amputations, feet, toes, um, we get placentas, and we get occasional autopsies. Cytopathology is the study of smears and fluids. So pap smears are what most people are familiar with. Those go to fall under cytopathology. Um, but there are some other things like the thyroid aspirate that also are just a smear on a slide as opposed to a, a piece of tissue. We do tumor board conferences, which is when we have a multidisciplinary conference um, where we have surgery, oncology, radiology, and pathology that get together to talk about a difficult or complicated patient. So we talk about patient management. Daily consensus conference where all the pathologists show each other our difficult cases of the day and get kind of a you know team input. Lots of phone calls from other physicians. Frozen sections, which are really the only emergency in pathology. That's when a surgeon needs to get an instant real-time read on something they're looking at in the operating room. So they'll take a piece of tissue and send it down to me. And we have a way of sort of rapidly processing tissue. It takes about 10 minutes and I can call them up right away and say, this is malignant or this is benign. 
um, and that can happen at any hour of the day. Usually it's during the work day, but not always. Um, teaching conferences for residents and medical students, laboratory administration, which is um, the work involved in being the medical director of a laboratory. There's a lot of um, uh, sort of not paperwork necessarily, but a lot of um, you know looking at instruments, staffing issues, that kind of thing. And finally, hospital committees. So um, pathology has a lot in common with bird watching, and a lot of pathologists make this comparison. Um, this is a, a house sparrow seen through the as seen through the binoculars. Right. So you have to be really observant of details. You have to know what to look for. Um, you have to recognize tumors in non-textbook conditions, including partial glimpses, unusual variants, that kind of thing. And you have to have a good mental image of what each tumor looks like. And it just so happens that this skill set kind of overlaps with people who are good at birding or who like birding. So for example, this is a mixture of herons and egrets. Every panel here is a different species. Um, I'm used to be really into birding and now I'm pretty rusty, so I can't name them from memory. But if, you, if, if there's anyone here who's into birding, you probably can do it. But if you're not into birding, I mean, these are five nearly identical birds. But if you know what to look for, first you look at the legs. And some of the birds have yellow legs, some have white legs, and some have black legs, some of the species. You look at the beaks. Some birds have a black beak with a yellow eye, like this guy. Some have a yellow beak. Some have a grayish black beak and a green eye. Some have a yellow beak and a yellow eye. And it turns out that the combination of beak, eye, and leg color is unique to each species. And so all you have to do is know, you know which combination goes with which species, and you know which heron or egret you're looking at. Um, when you're first starting out, if you know to look for those features, then you can look it up in your book and be like, oh yeah, that was the, that was the um, juvenile uh, white egret. Um, and um, when you get better at it, you don't even have to look it up in the book anymore. You just know that those, you know, which features go with which species. So let's go back to our house sparrows, right? So now we're, this is a quiz. So we've got six different sparrows here. And from memory, if you're not into birding and you don't know, which one is the house sparrow that I showed you three minutes ago? So if you um, know what you're looking for, like if I showed you a house sparrow now, you'd be like, okay, I need to look at the breast, I need to look at the eyes, I need to look at the chin, right? But if you didn't know to look for that beforehand, you're not gonna have a very detailed mental image in your head. So the first question, the first vote here is, did the house sparrow have a streaky breast or not? Any votes? Not. 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 That's correct. That house sparrow did not have a streaky breast, so we can get rid of those two. Did the house sparrow have a black chin or a white chin? A black chin? Very good. So we'll get rid of those two. So now we're down to two really similar looking sparrows. But as it turns out, the one in the top left is a Eurasian sparrow, which doesn't live around here. So you can cross that one off and you're left with one by process of elimination. This is, our, this is our house sparrow. But as it turns out, this is also our house sparrow. This is just a female. And so we didn't know about that one. So this is the kind of approach you have to take when you're identifying a tumor that um, maybe you haven't seen before or that you should, you should remember that you're supposed to know. Okay, another bird analogy. All right, what's that? Cardinal. Cardinal, very good. That's the one that most people know. That's a pretty easy one, right? It's red, it's got the black face, little crest on the top. So that's a Northern Cardinal. So, so now for the rest of this analogy, I'm gonna be, they're birds, but I'm gonna be talking about them like they're tumors and sort of diagnosing them like they're tumors, like I, would, like I would, was making a diagnosis at work. So, you know, you're very familiar with the Northern Cardinal. And then one day you get this, you're like, what the hell is that? Like, it looks like a cardinal, but it's yellow. So it can't be a cardinal, but it looks exactly like a cardinal. So if this were a tumor in pathology, you know, if we, if we kind of are like, well, I mean, it looks almost exactly like this thing that I know, except for this one feature. 
we might sign it out descriptively and say, well, okay, this is a crested yellow bird, but let me tell you what else I have to say about it. It looks like a Northern Cardinal, but it's yellow. So the differential diagnosis, which is like the multiple choice list of other things this could be, also includes some variant of goldfinch or possibly a goth canary with hair gel. And so I would request that the physician would kind of look at that and say, you know, give me some information about like, what were you expecting? Were you expecting for this to be a cardinal or is this from some weird part of the world where there are birds I've never seen before? Um, you know, maybe give me some feedback. So, so the clinician calls back and they're like, you know what? Um, it sounds like maybe you don't know what this is for real. So, so I think you should probably send it out to someone who knows what they're talking about. Um, and this happens all the time, usually more politely, but that kind of thing, because consults are really easy in pathology. Um, what we do is just on a glass slide and glass slides are really easy to mail. So I can take that exact slide and send it downtown to Hopkins and have someone who does nothing but cardinals look at my, you know, is this a cardinal uh, question. So I send my yellow bird down to Hopkins and they're like, yeah, this is a northern cardinal with aberrant yellow pigmentation. Not a big deal. We see this. This variant has been reported in the literature and behaves similarly to the more common red variant. You're like, okay, cool. So I kind of knew what it was. I mean, I got pretty close, you know? Yeah, all right. Um, and then the physician's happy because there's an expert that's blessed it and now they know how to treat the patient. So six months later, you get this. It's like, well, okay, all right. I've seen this. I know what this is. I've done this before. This is a Northern Cardinal with aberrant hypopigmentation. Like he's just, you know, gray. He just doesn't make the red or whatever. Fine, we're good. And the clinician calls back and says, "You know what? I I don't I don't think that's right. I you just mm, it's it doesn't look like a cardinal on my end. Like this patient is really sick. I think it's something different. Could you just send it out?" They're like, "Okay, fine." But mm, I did that last time. Comes back, paraloxia. See comment. This extremely dangerous and lethal bird is often mistaken for the common and harmless northern cardinal. So. Pathology is basically just the constant struggle to identify the harmless looking things that will kill you and the malignant looking things that will not. All right, so that's our analogy. So now I wanna go and show you some actual slides um, of real um, patient material that we look at. And let me see, I'm probably gonna have to log back into this, yeah. So we're gonna start with a cervix biopsy. These are pretty common. So cervical neoplasia, cervical cancer is initially screened for or looked for with a pap smear, um, which is just a smear of, it's a scraping of the cells in the cervix and they get smeared. Actually, they don't smear them on a slide anymore. They, they kind of put them into a liquid solution and centrifuge them onto the slide. But, but you're looking at individual cells in a pap smear. And if there's anything concerning there, the patient will get um, a biopsy of the cervix, which is a little bite taken out of the cervix. And this is what it looks like. So it's gonna take a minute to come up um, to load. This is a, an actual slide, a glass slide that has been digitized. So we have an instrument that will uh, photograph the entire slide at super high power resolution. So it makes a virtual image that you can move around just like a microscopic slide. It's kind of time consuming, so we don't do this to make diagnoses on regular um, you know, cases, but we use it mostly for teaching and conferences and stuff. And so I can zoom in just like it was um, on a microscope and it's moving a little slow, but it'll eventually become focused. So this is the surface of the cervix. So it's a squamous epithelium, which is a type of layered epithelium with very flat cells. Um, and the normal cervix, again, this is our H and E stain. So nuclei are just little purple dots. Um, and the normal cervix has kind of a darker layer at the bottom of the epithelium. These are the stem cells or the regenerative cells that keep dividing um, to replenish the epithelium. And the cells gradually move up and up through the epithelium and eventually they just get shed off just like your, your skin cells would. And by the time they get up here, 
um, the nuclei are really, really tiny. The nuclei kind of shrink um, as they mature and get towards the top of the, the skin, the uh, epithelial surface. In, in a site like the mouth or the cervix, we actually call it a mucosa instead of the skin. So in, um, in HPV infection, which is the viral infection that um, is the root of most cervical cancers, the cells change. So I hope that you can see a difference between these cells on the right, which are normal, and these cells on the left, which are not. And the cells on the left look different because the nuclei look different. Really, uh, the vast majority of diagnosing cancer is interpreting the nuclei because it's the nuclear features that determine whether something is going to be benign or malignant. Um, it's, it's, you can see uh, genetic changes in cells as actual physical changes in their nuclei. Um, so a lot of what we do is kind of judgment about, you know, I don't like the way that nucleus looks. That looks concerning to me. That looks atypical. That looks malignant. Um, so one of the things we see here is that all of our nuclei are really big. They don't look like the tiny little pinpoint nuclei that we had in the benign cervix. They're really jumbled. They're sort of like, you know, you know like stones in a stone wall, kind of all different shapes and sizes kind of smashed together. There are a lot of mitotic figures. So these little um, bars here are actually mitotic spindles. Those are chromosomes lining up along the mitotic spindle. So that's an actual mitosis in process. And that's a lot more mitotic figures than we should normally have. Um, so this is a high-grade lesion, or H-cell is what it's called, high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And this is a precursor to squamous carcinoma of the cervix. Um, it's usually treated with surgical excision. They go in and they just cut out the part of the cervix that's involved. Um, and, but then that, you know, that patient is at risk for, for recurrence in the future, so they have to be carefully followed. Um, hopefully, with the advent of the HPV vaccine, um, this is going to get really rare. Um, but right now, uh, it's not that rare. Um, so that's cervix. Let me go back out. And we'll look at a biopsy of the colon. So the colon, let's see. Well, that's not a great place to start. Let me find another area. OK, so this is a colon biopsy. And I've added a scale bar here. This is a millimeter. So just so you can get a sense for what kind of magnification we're talking about. So this is a colon polyp that would be visible to the naked eye. Um, it was biopsied during a colonoscopy where they use a camera to visually inspect the entire length of the colon. And if there are any bumps, they biopsy them and send them to us to see what they are. And so this is a very typical tubular adenoma, which is a um, tumor of the colon. So down here, where it's not quite so blue, these are normal glands in the colon. This is the surface here. This is um, deep. And then where they look a lot bluer and denser, that's abnormal. And so that is um, the abnormal growth of a tubular adenoma. Tubular adenomas are really common. And uh, almost all the time, nothing ever comes of them. But occasionally, they can turn into cancer. And actually, this adenoma was captured in the act of turning into cancer. So this field right here, I hope you can see, looks different from over here. So this is the regular tubular adenoma. And here, it's like the, the spaces are a lot smaller. The glands are a lot more complicated with sort of holes within holes. Um, and this is an area of what's called high-grade dysplasia. So now here's a tenth of a millimeter on our scale bar. We're getting up closer. High-grade dysplasia is kind of like high-grade squamous uh, intraepithelial lesion of the cervix. It is a pre-malignant lesion. It's the last step before invasive carcinoma, and it needs to get out, needs to be taken out. So anytime a patient has high-grade dysplasia, dysplasia means abnormal growth, um, precancerous growth usually, um, then that patient needs to have that part of the colon taken out. 
Um, if that isn't noticed, um, if the patient is not getting regular colonoscopies or it's just not seen at the time of colonoscopy, um, it can eventually progress to adenocarcinoma. And that's what we're looking at here. So this was a this single specimen had tubular adenoma, high-grade dysplasia, and invasive adenocarcinoma all on the same slide. Um, obviously, once you have invasive carcinoma, the fact that you had a tubular adenoma is totally irrelevant. You kind of, you know, focus on the worst thing on the slide. Um, but in invasive carcinoma, we now have our cells um, invading their way through the connective tissue of the wall of the colon. Um, and now we're down to, if we look at those cells at really high power, so this little bar here, I hope you can see that, is at um, a hundredth of a millimeter or um, 10 microns. And so that's about the size of the nuclei that we're looking at. And nuclei are these purple things. And again, they're irregular, they're all different sizes and shapes. Um, I often say that if a group of cells looks like it was drawn by a six-year-old, it's probably malignant. Um, and that's definitely the case here. Okay, so any questions that have come up? Yeah. Actually, I have one. Um, we usually keep our questions till the end, but I feel like this is particularly relevant yeah. right now. Um, we learn in our classes, like in undergrad, a lot about how... Um, even if you take like two samples from the same tumor, they can have drastically different genetic profiles. Um, so when you're looking at a tumor, how many different like slices of it do you usually look at? That's a really good question and it depends on the type of tumor. Um, so there are some tumors where they tend to be very homogeneous throughout and you take, um, you know, for a five centimeter tumor, you might take three or four pieces of it. Um, so five centimeters, just like that. Um, so um, there are other tumors that are, for example, there are these tumors of the ovary. If you've ever heard of someone like having a 40 pound, maybe not 40 pound, 20 pound tumor taken out of their pelvis, right? Or massive ovarian tumors. Those tend to be a type of ovarian tumor called mucinous tumors. Um, and they are notorious for looking like for most of it looking kind of benign, but having these really small foci that are actually malignant. So in that type of tumor where we know that sampling is going to be a huge factor, we take a lot more sections than we would otherwise. Um, so it does, it does depend on the tumor and the organ. Um, and in terms of genetics, I mean, the genetics also, the thing about cancer, you know, you hear people talk about like curing cancer. Cancer is like 400 different diseases. Like it's, you know, it's like saying I'm going to cure infectious disease. Like if there's infinite number of types of things that can infect you. So, um, and that is true on a genetic level as well. So there are so many different uh, genetic types of things that can go wrong to cause cancer. Um, so some cancers that are the result of, say, a translocation um, are actually going to be completely homogeneous. All of the cells in the tumor are going to have the exact same genetics. Um, and there are others where you do get a rapid mutation within the tumor. Colon adenocarcinoma does tend to have a rapid mutation rate and has a very unstable genome. And so for those, you do tend to get different um, clones that can come up uh, in the same tumor. Thank you. That was a uh, super thorough answer. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. <laughs> All right. So I think we have, I think there was one more that I was going to show. Prostate, that's right. Okay. So prostate cancer, um, also really common. But prostate cancer is tricky because um, the nuclei really don't look that bad. It's one of those tumors where um, you, you're relying more on the, the way the cells, um, are arranged in the tissue rather than what the nuclei look like. So this is a, a prostate core biopsy. So that means they, um, take a long hollow needle and stick it in the prostate and pull it out. Um, and, and so they're getting this long cylinder of prostate tissue. Um, and they usually take about 12 of these cores in a typical prostate biopsy. And so the normal prostate, um, it's a secretory organ. So you have all these glands. Um, there's the nuclei that are dark purple and there's the cytoplasm. It's kind of this light pink fluffy stuff. 
um, and it secretes prostatic fluid into these ducts and that eventually um, goes out the um, ejaculatory duct. But um, prostate cancer looks like this. So these little glands here are actually all prostate cancer. And it's really tricky until you know what to look for because the nuclei themselves are actually kind of small and round and they all kind of look similar. If this is really subjective, you'll have to trust me on this. Um, right now it's just pink and purple dots to you, but I will tell you that they look all pretty similar and it looks they look like the nuclei of bland, um, benign prostate glands. But what's different is the way they kind of creep through the tissue here in these tiny little glands, as opposed to these big, well-developed glands that are the benign ones. So that's just another way, another tool we have to use to diagnose cancer in different organs. Sometimes it's the way the nuclei look and sometimes it's the way the, the glands um, are shaped and, and interact with the tissue. Um, okay, so let me go back. Yeah. Uh, so you, in prostate, I, I know the prostate gets bigger uh, as you age. So would, would that also mean the glands get a little smaller too? Like, could that like possibly have like some type of like mix up on it or? Um, no, usually when pro so prostate hypertrophy is the process of the prostate getting larger with age, but it's usually uh, in that disorder, it's not the glands that are getting bigger. It's the, the stroma, which is the pink stuff. It's like the connective tissue in between the glands. Um, so you get more of that, but the benign glands don't change. They still look the same. Yeah. So it doesn't change the way that the prostate cancer looks in the gland. Okay. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the training and what, you know, what type of person makes a good pathologist. So I think to be happy and successful in pathology, you do have to be fairly visually oriented and also have some facility for spatial reasoning. There's a lot of um, having to think in three dimensions given a two dimensional image. So you do have to be able to sort of manipulate 3D things in your head. You have to be comfortable using a microscope. I mean, it sounds like not a big deal, but like I'm sitting here looking in this microscope for four or five, six hours a day. So if that's something that um, like, if you just can't stand the thought of sitting still at your desk for that many hours a day, then this is not the right field for you. Um, you have to be, it's, it's a very intellectual field. You have to be pretty disciplined and a self-directed learner. Um, even still, I mean, I've been in practice for 14 years now and I'm still looking stuff up in a book at least once a day because we just, there's so many tumors out there that just don't look you, typical. They don't, they don't follow the textbook. They look weird. I have to, you know, make sure that I'm looking at what I think I'm looking at. So there's a lot of just on a daily basis, I'm researching cases. You have to work well with other physicians. You don't really see patients at all, um, but you do interact a lot with other physicians. So it's not a completely isolated job. I mean, my day is spent in an office by myself, but I'm interacting with other people all day long. Um, strong writing skills. So in pathology, everything is, um, is written out as a final diagnosis. And sometimes there are subtleties that are really important to convey to the clinicians. So having a good uh, facility with words is helpful there. I would say introverts are disproportionately represented in pathology. Um, as are artists and bird watchers and other people that kind of do these visual things. And anecdotally, people who find four leaf blowers. I swear to God, you know, I mean, I assume it's because it's a visual thing, right? But a, a lot of pathologists will be like, oh yeah, I found them all my life. It's really weird. Um, so the pros of pathology, um, you have a lot of control over your own schedule. So I get a certain amount of work that I need to accomplish, accomplish in a day, but how I structure that work is totally up to me. If I want to come in at 5 a.m. and crank it out and leave at noon, I can do that. Um, if I want to, you know, do other stuff in between, like it's, it's really um, up to me. There are very few emergencies or crisis situations. Um, in pathology, you do almost always have the luxury of time, which is completely the opposite of something like trauma surgery, right? So if I get a really difficult patient and I don't have an answer right now, I have stalling tactics. 
books. I can do some special stains. I can show it to my colleagues. If I really don't know, I can send it downtown to Hopkins. So I can take as much time as I need to come up with an accurate diagnosis, which is, is reassuring. Um, the compensation is good and the work hours are good. Um, so it, it's obviously is gonna vary by geographic region and by the type of job that you're in, but overall it's a, it's a pretty well compensated field and the hours are, are not bad. Um, low medical legal risk, pathologists don't get sued very often. It's not like OB um, where there's a really high medical legal risk. There are no mid-levels that are competing for privileges. So in a lot of fields of medicine, you have like PAs and nurse practitioners and nurse anesthetists um, and other um, professions that, that kind of overlap in scope with what other clinicians can do. And those um, mid-levels tend to be cheaper for hospitals to hire. And so there is sort of a competition there. Um, in pathology, there's, there's nobody else. Like nobody does what we do. No one is allowed to do what we do. There are no mid-levels. So there's no one competing um, for our jobs. Um, it's a very intellectual field with a lot of detective work. So if you just really like kind of the science and detective work side of medicine, it's a really great field. Um, it's not that competitive. I mean, I, I am sad to say this. I think it's a fantastic job and not many people want it. There are by far more residency spots in pathology than there are U.S. grads who want one. Um, so most U.S. grads get their top choice in residency and do really well. Um, there's no patient contact, right, which for some of us is a pro. <laughs> Some people it's a con, but I, you know, I did medical school. I saw a lot of patients. I felt like I could live without that. So, um, and cons. So lots of bad smells and occasionally maggots. I am not exaggerating. So um, bad smells, right? So autopsy is full of bad smells, but even if you're not doing an autopsy, like things are, you know, you get stomach contents, you get colons that are full of stool, full, completely full of stool. Um, you get things that are dead, things that are rotting and occasionally an amputation a neglected diabetic foot, you actually will get maggots um, in the specimen. So it's not a specialty for those who are easily grossed out. Um, nobody knows what you do. There's lots of autopsy and basement jokes and, you know, and lots of e physicians, other physicians that are like, so pathology, is that a medical degree? Like, did you go to medical school? And you're like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> so that gets old. Um, your mistakes are preserved in glass forever. So this is actually, this, this is something that gives us a lot of, a lot of anxiety. So like if you're a, seeing a, a patient in the emergency room and you miss something on a physical finding, it's really hard to go back and prove that that finding was there at the time you examined the patient. If I miss something on a slide, that slide is preserved in amber forever. So it's very easy for someone to come back in 10 years and say, this is the same slide that you looked at and you missed the tumor. Um, so that, you know, that causes a lot of pathologists to be fairly obsessive about what we do, um, about being careful um, with our diagnoses. Um, in hospital practice, you're kind of at the mercy of surgeons. Um, you know, one of us is designated as on call and the person who's on call has to stick around until the surgeries are done. Because if a surgeon needs you for a frozen section, like you have to be there right away. Um, so that can be a kind of a drag occasionally. Um, that's the one time when you're really not in control of your time. But not everyone uh, takes frozen section call. That depends on your practice. There's no, no patient contact. So that's a pro for some people, a con for others. Um, there's no clinical training after medical school. So you're useless in an emergency. So like if you're on a plane, they're like, someone's having a heart attack and they're asking, is there a doctor on board? Like you do not press that button. You will never press that button if you become a pathologist. Um, so the reason is every, almost every other medical specialty with the exception of psychiatry, your first year out of medical school is your internship year. And even for people who are not gonna be treating patient, patients like radiologists, they go through a clinical year where they're taking care of patients in the hospital. Um, and pathology is the only residency, aside from psych, that doesn't do that. So we go straight from medical school into a pathology residency. We never take care of patients after medical school. So this means that you, know, you don't have a lot of the fundamental skills that, that people associate with being a physician. And it means that step three is kind of hard to pass 
So if you, I don't know if you guys know much about the USMLE, these three exams that you have to pass to become a licensed physician, two of them you take in medical school, but the third one you take after your first year of residency. And for most people, that's an easy exam. You just walk in and take it. You don't even study because it's what you've been doing all year. But for pathologists, you actually do have to study because you haven't been taking care of, you know, diabetic and hypertensive patients since you were in medical school. Um, and the last con is autopsy. So autopsies are gross and unpleasant. And a lot of people in medical school, that's their one exposure to pathology. So I just put that on here to say that if you watch an autopsy and are like revolted and you think I cannot do that with my life, that doesn't mean you can't be a pathologist. Like you should still, if you're interested in pathology, you should still try to do a pathology elective in medical school um, because Assuming most usually if you do that, it, it won't be on the autopsy service. It'll be like on the surgical service where you're looking at tumors and stuff. Um, because for most of us, I mean, I do, I do maybe seven or eight autopsies in a year. So it's a really small part of my job now. And I don't enjoy them, but it, it just, you know, it's you just grit your teeth and get through it. Um, so there's so much more to the field than just autopsies. Um, this is data from the, the national uh, matching program. So you can see that pathology had in 2020, 600 positions um, of which 587 were filled. Um, only 200 of those were by um, fourth year medical students in a US, sorry, that's not true. 200 were MDs and um, 67 were DOs. So that's how many were filled by US medical grads, either in an MD or a DO program. Um, 54 by US citizen international medical grads. So that tends to be people from like the Caribbean medical schools, um, occasionally other medical schools um, in Europe. And then this is your foreign medical grads. So non US citizen international medical grads. Um, and they are disproportionately represented in pathology in part, I think, because it's an accessible training pathway. Um, these are really smart people, obviously, but you know, it just tells you that the fact that there are so many more spots than there are um, US medical grads, it's, it's not a very competitive specialty right now. There are about 160 residency programs, only two in Maryland. Um, it tends to be really just in the major metropolitan areas because it's, you know, there just aren't that many programs. It's comparable to primary care in terms of the number of positions that are filled by U.S. grads. And the number of applicants have dropped a little bit in the past four years. Um, we talked about this other stuff. And then finally, pathology does have a graduated responsibility program problem in the sense that um, a pathologic diagnosis to bill for making a pathology diagnosis, you cannot be a trainee. So as you go through pathology residency, you never have the experience of making a diagnosis, on, a final diagnosis on a patient and that becoming part of the medical record. It's only attendings that can actually make that diagnosis. Whereas if you're in any other residency, like you're taking care of patients and making decisions on your own throughout residency. So it does lead to, for a lot of people, a really jarring um, transition between residency and the real world, because you go from not being able to make your own diagnoses to having to make your own diagnoses, like overnight. Um, a lot of people use fellowship to kind of buffer that transition. So they're acting like an attending, but they're still working with a training program. Um, but it is something that's, that's kind of unique to pathology, I think. Boards, you must be board certified to practice. You can get your boards in AP, CP, or both, depending on what residency track you're in. Boards are at the end of your last year in residency, and then there are subspecialty boards if you do a fellowship. Um, compensation, the numbers are not important because it varies so much by region. Um, just This is just to show you that the average pathology uh, salary is kind of right in the middle between the high um, compensation surgical specialties and primary care. This says the mean is 308,000, but um, there's a huge range. I mean, that it just, the, the absolute number doesn't mean much here. But you can see that most pathologists feel that they're getting, they've got a really good gig. Um, they, they're really well compensated for their time. Um, I, this is, so this is to represent my pathway to get to pathology, which was extremely convoluted. And I can talk about that in the question and answer session if you want. Um, finally, a few books. 
Um, so Working Stiff, this is uh, written by um, a forensic pathologist in New York City, who's fantastic, Dr. Melanac. She talks about um, being a medical examiner. This is a fictional series. Um, this Patricia Cornwell has written a bunch of books with her hero, Kate Scarpetta, or Kay Scarpetta, who's a forensic pathologist, if you're into that sort of thing. Poisoner's Handbook, which is about toxicology and clinical chemistry in the 1920s. Um, and uh, finally, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. If you've never read this, you definitely should. It's not really pathology, but it is about cancer and cancer cells. And it did happen at Hopkins and, and you know, pathology was involved. Um, so that's sort of my recommended reading list. Last, lastly, um, when you go into medical school um, and you are learning about pathology in the first two years, this is most likely the book that you're gonna be using. It's uh, the Robbins Pathology. And it really just talks about um, the reasons behind cancer, sort of. It's, it's not really, it's not really like how to diagnose things or how to stage tumors or how to work up um, complicated cases. It's just like, this is melanoma. Let me tell you about, you know, the processes that happen to, um, for melanoma to, to develop. Um, so it's very much basic science. Then when you get to residency, there's, you know, this massive jump to the Sternbergs and other thick volumes. My Sternberg, okay, so this, this is Sternberg. <laughs> and it's two volumes. So it's, you know, this huge abrupt transition from a kind of primer on sort of hypothetical or theoretical pathology to something that's designed for a professional audience. It's, it's like a completely different language. It's, um, it's, it's drinking from a fire hose um, in the worst way. So uh, when I was in training um, 14 years ago, um, I, whoops, created a bridge between the Robbins and the Sternberg. And so this is a much smaller book. So let's see, it's much smaller. And there's a lot more white space. It's much, much more user-friendly. Um, and it's um, sort of 15 or 20 pages on each organ system. And so now, and it's, it's designed to give first years in pathology residency a um, an introduction to the organ system, the main tumor types, what you're looking for, um, that how you work things up, how you stage things. It's a really basic level, but it gives you that broad overview that you need before you can even start understanding the language. Um, and so it turned out that this, this bridge was a, a, a really unmet need um, because within about five years, this became the textbook for almost all the pathology programs in the country. So if you go into pathology residency, this is what you will start with in your intern year, and then you will graduate to the bigger um, Sternberg. And then once you're actually a subspecialist in practice, you get into the multi-volume thing. So this is volume 28, um, and with each volume representing its own organ system. Um, so you just, you know, the more specialized you get, like you just wouldn't believe how much could be written about, you know, one single organ. Um, and so it just, the first, further in you get, the more the information expands. There's really no ceiling. <coughs> All right, so that's it. This is an umbilical cord. Um, <coughs> umbilical cords have two arteries and one vein, so they always make a face. So pathologists are really into um, umbilical cord emojis. So that's where I will stop <coughs> and take questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. We don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to ask a couple questions. From I know. Sorry. <laughs> going to be a little. No, no, no. You're perfectly fine. The presentation was amazing. Seriously. Thank um, you. But the questions are going to be a little bit rapid fire. So um, you mentioned that you have more free time somewhat at work than your husband, who's also a physician. Do you find pathology to be low stress? And how do you have like how do you consider your work life balance? Um, yeah, I mean. <clears throat> training residency is stressful for everybody, but in terms of um, my actual job, I do consider it to be really low stress. And it's in part just that I have a um, kind of complete control over my own environment um, and my day-to-day, -day, uh, my moment-to-moment -moment schedule. So for some people, that that's what makes for, you know, an unstressful day. Yeah, I think it makes it a very attractive profession. Mm -hmm. um, what attracted you particularly um, especially with the limited experience you have with pathology in med school, what directs yeah. you towards pathology as 
your future career path? When you well, were- I'm embarrassed to admit that a large part of it was the fact that the residency did not involve overnight call in the hospital. Um, when I started residency, I already had a baby, who some of you know. Um, and so um, the idea of having to sleep in the hospital um, as a new mom was sort of a non-starter. Um, and my husband had just been through his residency and it was, it was tough. Um, and so initially I kind of started researching it because of that. Um, but it turns out like I could not have picked a better field. It's just exactly... Um, you know, perfectly tailored to the, the way I like to work. And I had had some experience in microscopy before my PhD. Um, I did a lot of electron microscopy. So I was already sort of accustomed to spending a lot of time with the microscope. And I knew that I enjoyed that. Um, so that's pretty much why I went into it. No, that makes a ton of sense. Um, our final question, because it's five o'clock. Um, what advice do you have for your pre-med self? Oh, for my pre-med self? Yes. Um, (laughs) Well, I got to, I got to medicine in a really convoluted way. So I probably would have told myself, skip grad school, just go straight to med school. It's not worth it. (laughs) But, but not everyone's everyone's going to make that decision. So. That was awesome. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. I hope I convinced at least some of you to someday do a pathology elective in med school. If not, we feel much more educated. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Thank you again uh, for coming. And everybody, we dropped the quiz in the chat. So make sure to fill that out. Um, Take time to write those journal entries. Um, Again, we are extending this to 48 hours because we know how busy school is with online. Um, Be on the lookout for more announcements soon. And uh, make sure to take those time on those questions. All right. Make sure your email is in the form and be watching out for a newsletter about January that will also have upcoming announcements for February. Yep.